hand versus chainsaw. It looks painful. Our hospitals are taking care of more patients than ever. You're right. <laughs> With medical teams under constant pressure. Can Dr. Pixie come to resource, please? Somebody as poorly as this little one, we really need to treat them quickly. To meet our expectations. I'm just worried about what it's going to be like afterwards. But there's a crucial member of the team we sometimes forget. I've never ever been on a bed like this. The hospital bed. Another ward, another storage, another bed. <laughs> In our lifetime, we are likely to need one of them at least three times. I've probably spent a quarter of my life on a hospital bed. <laughs> In this series, our cameras have been given unprecedented access to beds in four very different hospitals across the country. It's life, life and death, and everything that goes in between. We'll see the world through the bed's eyes. Hello, my love. Hiya. As they share the most challenging. I don't know what to do. I don't know. Most intimate. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no. And most rewarding. Happy birthday. <laughs> in hospital for Moments of our lives. Thank you for being here. Have you been anywhere else? And a hospital cannot function without beds. Beds are vital. This is the secret life of the hospital bed. Birmingham's Queen Elizabeth Hospital has 9,000 staff working around the clock to look after anyone who falls ill. This is the hospital's day surgery unit. It treats around 500 patients every week. Just closing some, a few stitches. The day surgery beds are a small army of intensive shift workers that are on duty 12 hours a day. Today, day surgery bed 40 will be with 44-year-old Lisa O'Nions, who's here for a life-saving procedure. Right then, I said I didn't get the dash in there, so I pronounced it wrong this morning, so I don't, oh, don't worry. <laughs> but don't get worry. that a lot. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Onions, onions. <laughs> <laughs> I answered that. I was right. like, we went too short. I think uh, Lisa has a serious heart defect and needs a pacemaker to keep her alive. Sometimes I do get a little bit angry with myself, I suppose, really, because I think, well, I don't, don't drink, I don't smoke, I exercise regularly, I eat well, healthily. Um, why me? But at the end of the day, you sort of have to deal with it. It's, it's there, it's not going to go away, and actually it's keeping me alive now. So just get on with it. I think uh, I've got to... Today, Lisa is having the batcher changed on her current pacemaker. Do you have a list of medication? I don't have any. No meds? Ooh. Nurse MacDonald is dealing with Lisa's pre-op care. So just a bit about your past medical history. Okay. So the reason the pacemaker was put in? Six sinus syndrome. Is that from a child or? Uh, well, they found it when I was 23. Oh, OK. Just a regular heartbeat? Just a regular heartbeat. I was just going for a routine check-up check -up rather for some medication and my GP found that I got an irregular heartbeat and oh, it okay. sort of picked up from there. Let's go out a little rhythm. Only 2% of pacemakers are fitted in people under the age of 45. If Lisa's condition hadn't been picked up by her GP, she wouldn't be alive today. Are you next of kin? Okay. Uh, Stuart O'Neill's. That's my husband. Is he coming with you? Um, he's come up once yeah, I've yeah. had the procedure That's done. That's fine. Because I said, well, you'll yeah. probably be, so to speak, in the way. <laughs> I didn't know that my hubby could be here, you see. That's yeah, why I said, yeah. well... Has he got a job where he could just snip out there? Yeah. 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 So it, might, it might keep you... Okay. When am I scheduled to go down? Do I've just know? got to double check the list. I mean, I don't know how I'm going to let him know. Do I just let him know afterwards? Do, or? do you want to text him now? Have a number? Oh, do you know Yeah, of course. Sorry. Lisa married her husband, Stuart, 20 years ago. She wanted him to be here, but for now, she's facing the operation on her own. Can your wedding band come off, or do you want it taped? Uh, I'll have it taped, if that's yeah, OK. No and the one on my toe as well, please, if that's OK. Is that a wedding band on your toe too? Is it? Is it like a special ceremony you have? <laughs> <laughs>
Is it not? I went into the wedding ring centre in mm-hmm. Florida and he said, I've never sized up somebody's toe before. I've never <laughs> seen a wedding band on a toe. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> it's very unusual. Oh, that's cool. You have to glitz up those toes, don't you? Of every two each year. Out of every anniversary. Yes. I've got something right now. Just a little bit of tape. And I'm going to go towards the toe. Is that alright? <laughs> I've never seen a wedding band on a toe, honestly. That's it. Doesn't come off. Only <laughs> microphone. Yes. Professor Laver, an expert in cardiac devices, will be carrying out the operation. We know that when you're not pacing, you just stop. That's right. Yeah. So to be absolutely sure, we'll just put a, a temporary wire, and that just um, covers us during the process oh, no, of when changing switching. the box. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wondered how that was going to work because I thought, yeah, well, yeah but no, that, that's, explained that's it. the safest way to do it. Changing a battery on a pacemaker is an intricate procedure that can take up to an hour. Um, and do, do you know whether you'll be using the extra? Yeah, I'll just use the same same scar. I'll, I'll have a look. Worry. If I need to add another one, I might have to, um, but okay. uh, I'll try not to. Okay. So, very good. See okay. Soon. Very good. Thank you. It's 2 p.m. Husband Stuart hasn't arrived yet, but Lisa's friend Kay from school works at the hospital. I'll go now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming to Day surgery bed 40 takes Lisa to theatre. I think Stuart might be on his way, so um, yeah, yeah. In the next hour, Lisa will have her pacemaker renewed to keep her alive. the Royal Victoria Infirmary in the heart of Newcastle. It's one of only five UK centres to offer emergency consultant care 24 hours a day. These A&E beds work the hardest, seeing more patients than any other hospital bed, on average 10 a day. That guy's been discharged now, he's got an outpatient point with us. Champion. Eight-year-old Mason's been treated here many times for an ongoing condition, pressure on the brain. But today, it's his dad, Lee, who's waiting to be seen. It's not the first time he's been to a and I'm a little bit accident prone, you could see. Operations, snapped fingers, broken bones. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm always doing daft things, is that right? Yeah. I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect with broken ribs and um, two bite marks on my back. It was just stupidity, really, just friends being that. <laughs> A&E bed 15 is ready for its next patient. Mason and mum Michaela will be Lee's bedside support. Hello, is it Lee? Yeah. Want to come and have a seat up here? Yeah. I'm Bob John, I'm one of the consultants. Consultant Mr. Jarman has 13 years' experience in emergency medicine. He'll assess whether Lee's ribs have been broken. What's your name? Mason. Mason. Mason, okay. So, I'm going to ask your dad a few questions. Is he your dad, I presume? You're not his dad. I am. You're his dad? (laughs) All right, okay. Okay, well, what I'm going to do, let's examine you now. So, I'll just close the door just so nobody can see his examine you, and then we'll do that, okay? Oh, that's a good dad, Mason. Okay, well trained. (laughs) I've got a helper. So, yeah, somebody's uh, decided to have you for supper then, eh? Ah, yeah, it's snack. <laughs> so, let's just have a little feel. I'm just going to feel in the middle, okay? All right, down there, yeah? Yeah, that's all. Let's just have a little feel here. Is that sore? Yeah. 
you can see there's a couple of uh, bite marks that are crusted over a little bit now. Mm -hmm. There's also some bruises there where it looks as if you, you might have been grappled a bit. Uh -huh. Let's just have a little feel on this side. Can you just take a deep breath in for me? Ah. Again? Okay. Okay, can you just rest yourself back? Just be careful because it's going to be sore. Oh, no, it's going to be a bad Yeah. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get my little oil sand machine and we're just going to check that there's no evidence of your lung being collapsed down or any blood in the bottom. Right. If that's okay, then that's good. Right. Okay, okay, I'll come back in a few minutes. No problem, thank you. It looks as if he has got some trauma to his chest. There is a bite marks on one side, uh, some uh, bruises, and he's also tender with bruising to the side of his chest too. So the most important thing is that we need to rule out things that may be serious, like a collapsed lung or bleeding around the uh, lung itself. And human bites can get infected with bacteria, and they can also uh, transmit the virus, viruses between humans too. To see uh, two, two big bites to his chest is, uh, is uh, you know, quite unusual, to be fair. Between them, Lee and son Mason have been in hospital more than 30 times. Dad, how many times have you been in this hospital? Uh, quite a few times. <laughs> I've probably spent a quarter of my life on a hospital bed. <laughs> Try and guess how many times I've been in. I think I've lost count of us. But we have only 200 more blue. <laughs> have you ever snapped your finger? Uh, no, I don't think I have. I don't think I'll tell you if you have. Does any fingers look like that? No. Don't think so. Ah, oh, Dad, it still hurts. Mm -hmm. Alright. Look at that. <sighs> Lee will have to stay on A&E bed 15 for further assessment. Next door, at the Great North Children's Hospital, is the Paediatric Emergency Department. Hello, it's A&E. Its nine A&E beds are smaller, but they work around the clock to care for the under-16s. We have nine beds in total. We've got six cubicles and then we've got three monitoring beds behind us here. The monitoring beds are used as a step down from resus or for sick children that need a bit more one-on-one -on -one care. Today, paediatric A&E bed 27 is expecting a four-year-old. So if I can get you in to have a seat on yes. the bed. Sure. Parents, Sarah and Mark, have rushed their son Theon to the emergency department with stomach pain. Less than a month ago, he had emergency surgery to remove a bowel blockage. He's being assessed by Nurse McGee. Whilst on holiday in Dubai, he, we thought he had a little tummy bug, uh -huh. which turned into something a bit more sinister. He actually had an intersusception uh -huh. in his bowel. So he's had part of his um, intestine removed okay. out there and everything's yeah. been doing great up until last night when he started getting a bit of loose bowel movement okay. with no pain, but today he's complained quite a lot of the pain and quite on the scar tissue across. And has he had loose stools this morning as well? Yeah. The thing is, it's a similar colour to what it was the day before it all kicked off. Right. So that's why we're just a bit cautious. Quite, you can see. Just want to make sure he's all right. Intersusception is the most common cause of bowel blockages in young children. If left untreated, this condition can lead to death in less than five days. Wow, that's okay. You've been Don't very brave. Cry. We were just at the pool and just the normal day of back in our nice holiday. 
and he started saying he had a bit of tummy pain and felt a little bit sick and walked him out the pool and he was sick and we thought, oh, maybe he's just had too many milkshakes. The hotel had a medical centre, so we just went down to see them. They didn't even check in, they just said he needs to go to the hospital straight away, something not right, where we got sent to the hospital and did ultrasound, did an x-ray which showed that he had this blockage in his bowel. The surgeon came out and said he needed surgery there and then because the situation he was in was like a life saving operation, it was urgent surgery. Just when you get a couple of symptoms that were very similar to ah, the what's last. happened before, it ah. happened when I'm in Dubai, you sort of get a little bit ah. nervous. An X-ray is the only way of determining four-year-old Theon's condition. And they're doing some more images of his abdomen, you know, the bowel and the intestine, everything's working as it should be. Well, you worry that, hope, hope to God, you know, that it's not, we're not going down the same route as before with this obstruction. In less than an hour, the results will reveal if young Theon's life is at risk again. In Birmingham's day surgery unit, bed 40 is taking 44-year-old Lisa for her heart operation. She's having a new battery fitted to her pacemaker. Without it, she wouldn't be alive. OK, it's good. You OK? All right. We're just going to have a look at the device and see what it's doing. Local anaesthetic uh, will give her three milligrams of the uh, if, uh, if you're anxious, we'll give you a lot more. Yeah, okay. I think that Don't worry, you'll be fine. Okay. Good, excellent. Cardiologist Professor Lever is in charge. Lisa will be sedated, but awake throughout. And this lady has had a pacemaker in for quite some years, since 1998, and what we're trying to do uh, is just change the battery. Basically, we'll take out the whole pacemaker and put a new one in. So it's less common at her age. Uh, it's mainly in the 60, 70, 80 year olds. It's much more common to have pacemakers. So we're just checking at the moment that their own heart is actually beating when we take the pacemaker off, so that when we change it, the, 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 the heart just doesn't stop. The team reduced Lisa's heart rate. They're on standby in case her heart stops beating. How are you feeling there at the moment? I think it's not for too long. What we'll do is we'll leave you like that just for a moment, um, just to give you a bit longer to adjust, having been at 60 beats per minute, now you're down to 40 beats per minute. So. You know, it takes you a minute or two to, to adjust to that, OK? Mm -hmm. So we'll check with you again before leaving it. Lisa's husband, Stuart, has arrived at the hospital. She doesn't whinge at all. She does just take it in a stride. This morning, she put the girls off to school as normal. I went to work, I was told to do, be as normal as possible. Um, but now you, your mind's not. At work, your mind, that's where you, you're worrying. And then as soon as she tells me, um, you know, that uh, there's a time for a theatre, I'll just jump ship from work and, and come straight to you. And then it's just a, a worry then, make sure everything's OK and you're here for her when she comes through from the operation. Hold on. All right. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. So um, we didn't have to put in a temporary wire um, because actually her heart was beating quite well. Uh, although it, it did stop for a little bit, uh, it was a very quick change of the box. The uh, whole point of uh, pacemaker treatment is to make it as least intrusive to the patient uh, as possible. And the, the boxes now are smaller. so. Um, that, that is much better cosmetically, and I'm very conscious in patients who are so young who are going to have so many scars to be as as uh, atraumatic as, as you possibly can. She's in good hands. I think a very good hospital, very good surgeons. Transformed her life. She couldn't breathe properly. Heartbeat. She was stopping for five to six seconds sometimes. She needs this place well. Lisa is transferred back to day surgery on bed 40. She'll soon be reunited with her husband, Stuart, back on the ward. Mm -hmm. 
It's 3.20 p.m. at the Royal Victoria Infirmary in Newcastle. A&E Bed 15 is with Lee, an A&E regular, and son Mason. I'm a doctor. <laughs> I'm going to make us look like creepy. <laughs> Watch how creepy. <laughs> Right, Dr. Mason Chatterhill. Lee was admitted to A&E an hour ago with suspected broken ribs and human bite marks on his back. Do you almost get mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Consultant Mr. Jarman is back to examine Lee's chest with an ultrasound machine. It will detect any damage to Lee's ribs or bleeding in his lungs which could seriously affect his circulation. OK, so let's do the good side first, OK? Take a nice deep breath from me. OK, so we've got some ribs. Yeah. Yeah, and this is the surface of your lung. And as you take a deep breath in and out, it moves up and down, yeah? Oh, yeah. So that means it hasn't collapsed down, which is good. OK, that's good. Now, you just stay where you are. Yeah. I'm just going to change and look for any evidence of bleeding in your chest, OK? So we haven't found any babies yet, Mason. Uh -huh. No babies. Uh -huh. I, I just must have a brother. I've already got a sister. Yeah. Mason's used to hospitals. He's been in and out of them due to an ongoing illness. Unsurprisingly, he's become interested in medicine. These are all the ribs here. Yeah. Oh, then? Yeah, these are all the ribs. So, how can you tell if it's bleeding in the tummy? I was just going to ask that. But because what we're looking for is, it looks like um, a black fluid. And we can't see any down here. This is where we get it all down here, but there's nothing to see really. So, that's all very good, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And looking at it, you know, there's nothing that looks Looks bad. It all looks good. Oh, right. So that's, yeah. that's good. Mr. Jarman now needs to deal with the human bites. Oh, God, you're bad. Yeah. Your back's so, bad. There's a risk that hepatitis B and tetanus could have been transferred to Lee. Presumably, you haven't been vaccinated for hepatitis B. <laughs> but we, we do it as a precaution because yeah, the bugs in, in human mouths are going to be quite, quite nasty. You're going to have a couple of injections now, and one of them's for hepatitis B. Right. We take human bites very seriously. Mm -hmm. Okay? Look after yourself. Yeah, no you. more getting bitten, yeah? yeah? Thank you very much. No problem. Bye bye. Hi, Mason. Bye. 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 How many lives you got left? Can I think you got one? <laughs> Hopefully, I've got more than one leg. <laughs> Lee is on and off bed 15 within an hour. The next patient will be here soon. Today, all 29 beds in A&E are busy. Bed 9 has been allocated to 30-year-old Emma. She has a numb feeling in her arms and face and is anxious she may have had a stroke. Dr Earl Wright, a junior doctor in his second year of training, needs to make a diagnosis. For a couple of weeks, I've had pins and needles down my arm, down my right arm, okay. in my fingers especially, but kind of in numbness at the top. Right. I woke up with it, so I thought I may have kind of like slept on it funny. Yeah, or, laid on, laid on something. Yeah, um, but I've woken up this morning and my face feels like I've had, um, you know, like a dental injection. You know, when mm -hmm. it's kind of all wearing off. Really yeah, it's all just this right side. And is it the same sort of feeling that you're getting in your hand? Is it like a pins and needles feeling? Yeah. And is it mainly in your fingers, the pins and needles, or is it worse in your entire arm? Of, it kind of does kind of radiate, but I've got like a numbness up here mm -hmm. and it's my fingers that are pins and needly. But it's more my face that's bothering me, it's just really quite strange. Really strange? Mm hmm you know, relax down on the bed for me, I'll take an examination of your arm. 
Can you feel that in there? Mm -hmm. Does it feel the same on both sides? No, it feels peculiar on this side. It feels strange. Yeah, it just doesn't feel as prominent on this side. Like pinky and pinky is the same, yeah. Thumb and thumb is the same. Mm -hmm. It all feels... I can't describe it, it just feels bizarre. Bizarre. Fine. The tingling could indicate a number of serious conditions, including a stroke or multiple cirrhosis. And nothing runs in the family, does it? My mum's dad died of a heart complaint okay. when he was younger. No um, neurological problems running in the family at all? Few strokes. Okay. Alright. I think we should do some baseline blood tests. Okay, we'll take a calcium and make sure that's okay. Um, and a few others just to make sure that there's nothing, you know, aberrant there that could possibly be causing this. Okay. Emma has a very strange constellation of symptoms that basically adds up to her having numbness and paresthesia, which is abnormal sensation down her arm and the side of her face. It doesn't really make any sense at the moment. So we're going to do some blood tests and once, once those are back, I'm going to have a chat with one of the consultants and see, see whether we can have any fresh ideas. Because it doesn't really quite add up yet to anything that makes sense. <laughs> it's hand over time, so I've been here for 12 hours. So I will hand your case over to someone else and they'll come and, come and see you. All right? And we'll see whether we can get to the bottom of it. Okay. Um, but it might be that we might need further investigation. But if that is the case, we can sort that out. Okay, that's okay. fine. Okay, does that sound alright? Yeah, that's fine. Do you have any questions? No. No? Good stuff. Alright. Thank you. You just chill out here. Oh, all right. in here? Yeah, you just hang out here. Okay. Someone will be in soon. Alright. Thank you. Cheers. Emma's family history of strokes puts her at greater risk. Dr Earl Wright decides more tests are needed. For now, Emma will remain on A&E bed 9. Next door, in Newcastle's Great North Children's Hospital, four-year-old Theon has left paediatric bed 27. He's on his way to x-ray. Wow, Theon, look, the toys. Around a month ago, he had life-saving surgery to fix a bowel blockage. Mum Sarah and Dad Mark fear the blockage has returned. We've had some bloods taken. Um, that's just a check for any infection and anything like that. Hopefully they'll come back soon. And in the meantime, we've been sent here for an x-ray of his abdomen to check everything, all the bowel and intestine. So he thinks he's having a photo taken. <laughs> he's quite enjoying it in here because there's lots of toys and it's nice and bright for him. Yeah. Just concerned, obviously, until we have the x-ray done and the blood's back to know what's going on. There's the worry that the operation that he had done on Dubai, is there some complication that has arisen since that? Or is, you know, is it something else going on? There's still a lot of anxiety until you know. When we were in Dubai, you know, I was worrying then. But now I'm sort of trying to be a little bit more hopeful that you know, there's nothing sinister and then hopefully we'll get those answers shortly. Radiographer Wilson will be carrying out the x-ray. There you go, big boy. Right there you now, Nicola. I'm going to take the x-ray, OK? Are you speaking? How old are you? Four. Right, you ready? Yeah. Right. The last time Theon was on a hospital bed, he needed a life-saving operation. That you want breathing to come in. You're breathing in. Hand out. And just hold your breath. That's it. <laughs> the x ray will determine if four year old Theon is at risk again. Oh, bless him. Yep, you're all finished. Looking at his um, bowel. Yeah, he's had, he's had previous surgery, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Three and a half hours after being admitted, Theon is taken back to bed 27. Just sit next to you. Sit next to you. If that's okay with you. <laughs> hmm? How beautiful are you, Theon? 
<laughs> How beautiful are you? That's the time, Mummy. The time? The time is ten past one. So we can go home now? Not much longer now. Hello, how are we doing? Mm. How's your tummy? Okay. Is it feeling okay? Nurse McGee has the results. His x-ray is all clear. Four-year-old Theon does not have a blocked bowel. Lovely. If you have a little seat in the waiting room. Okay. Okay, Dorothy. Theon and his parents can go home. Oh, it's good news. His x ray looks absolutely normal. Everything's healed from the previous surgery that he's just had. His blood tests were all normal. And they're fine for us to go home and just keep a check on him. And things look good for the future for him. He's all happy. And you've no more pain, have you? You're doing good. Do you want to go home now? <laughs> I think he's absolutely <laughs> delighted to go home to his own bed. He can't wait. <laughs> In the adult emergency department of Newcastle's Royal Victoria Infirmary, a &E Bed 9 has been with 30-year-old Emma for an hour. She arrived with numbness in her face and arms. Feeling well. Um, I just feel strange, really. Thought maybe that I'd slept on it funny and trapped a nerve or something. Maybe I'd been bitten by something. Um, that's the only thing I can think of. The priority is to rule out a serious illness. Despite Emma's young age, there's a concern it could be a stroke. With a family history of the condition, this puts Emma at greater risk. Blood tests have been ordered to help the diagnosis. I don't think I could do it. Be a doctor or a nurse. I struggle to decide whether I want a pair of red shoes or black shoes. a and &E Bed 9 will be with Emma until her results are back. Okay. Is it is. Dr Seeley has just come on shift. He's taken on Emma's case. I understand you met Ben before. Yeah. Um, so he's told me that you've had pain in your right arm and then you've developed some numbness in your face and on your, on your arm. Yeah, that kind right? of like pins and needles in my fingers yeah. and kind of a numbness at the top of my arm. Um, and now it's this kind of side of my face. I feel like I've had a dental injection. And it's just got a bit numb. Yeah. Okay. Just for my peace of mind, do you mind just squeeze? I'm just going to examine your mm -hmm. neurology again. So squeeze my fingers. That's lovely. Right, you're a chicken. Don't let me push him down. Push him down. Great. Okay, that's all fine, isn't it? All right, well, the first thing to say is your blood tests were all completely normal, so that's great news. Yeah. We don't, certainly don't need to bring him to hospital. There's, what we look for in a and &E is anything that might be a life-threatening or yeah. be worrying in the next couple of days, which well, I don't think this is. It was just the concern about my face, really. Yeah, so it's a little bit of reassurance that it will probably sort itself out. Mm. Sometimes we never get to the bottom of it. Okay. The majority do eventually resolve. Mm -hmm. Things to worry about and to come back if it changes. So if it starts spreading, mm -hmm. so if you get more numbness elsewhere, and if you start getting weakness or if anyone notices that you've got a bit of a droopy face, anything to do with it, if you get drowsy or confused or anything like that, okay. um, or, or troubles with your balance or your speech. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. That all all right? Mm -hmm. Lovely. In that case, we can let you go home. Is it causing you any pain or anything? Do you need any pain to stay with you? No, it's just a bit weird. Okay. Brilliant. All right. Thank In that you. case, thank you very much. Thank you. Emma has not had a stroke. One of the things that we're told as juniors when we first come into the department is when you first see someone to look at them and work out if you think they're going to need to come into hospital or whether it's something that we can sort out and get people home. Obviously, anyone who needs to come into hospital has to come into hospital. They need a bed, they need a bed. Um, but if someone has got something that can be followed up safely in the community, then it's our job to make sure that they then get plugged into the right services. a and &E Bed 9 is released for its next emergency patient. At Newcastle's Great North Children's Hospital, paediatric bed 27 is about to meet seven-year-old Brandon. He's hurt his cheekbone. 
Brandon woke up this morning with a swollen eye. Not too, not too bad, so I sent him to school and I got a phone call at 10 o'clock um, saying that he was sobbing, um, pain down his face and his tooth. Got him to the dental hospital. It's definitely nothing to do with his teeth, so you're going to have to go over to the a and &E. Brandon will be assessed by trauma consultant Dr Carroll. So, what's happened to you? Dad, I've had something with my eye socket. OK. Is your eye socket sore? Yeah. OK. And you got hit by a swing, is that the right story? Yeah. What sort of swing? Was it a big wooden one or was it a plastic one? It was plastic. OK, and when did Different that happen? Colour. Yesterday. OK. And were you knocked out or do you remember everything that happened? I remember everything, but I didn't get knocked out. OK, good lad. And you hurt anywhere else apart from your face? No, just my face. OK. I had a toothache. OK. And I got clean teeth. Good lad. I've got clean teeth. <laughs> so have I. Brandon has been sent to A&E by the dental hospital. I'm going to start by looking down from the top of your head. So he gets phone on the right, isn't he? So whereabouts is your face most sore? Let's just have a look. This side OK? Yeah. So the swing only hit you on that side. Okay. How does your nose feel? Good. Good. Lad. And that cheekbone feels okay? Yeah. Open your mouth nice and wide. He's clearly a clever little lad. He takes things very quickly. Seemed to know exactly what I was talking about and was happy with the explanation that we've given him. Keep it open. Don't really push it shut. That's all. Does that hurt? It's probably the ideal environment to have him on a bed so you can look over the top. It's very, very important to assess symmetry in facial injuries. Just one pen over there. It's blurry. Okay, and over this way. Still blurry. Okay, and look up. Still blurry. Look down. Still blurry. Okay. It's, it's very, very unusual for youngsters to break the, the bones of their face. It does have quite a bit of swelling there, and that will be affecting his, his vision to some extent because he'll be able to see it. And because it's swollen up from below, it will just change the, the way he sees the world through that eye. I think it'll all come back to normal as, it, as the swelling settles. It might be worth trying to get an ice pack on that for five or ten minutes this evening just to try and reduce the swelling. He had one on at school as well and he's had the ibuprofen seems to have took it down quite a bit, So, but I'll put another one on when he gets home. Dr Carroll is satisfied that no further tests are needed. The facial bones are quite well protected in children because there's adult dentition in the sinus cavities and that forms an extra layer of protection. So you've got basically two layers of bone. So it's very unusual for children to break the bones of their face. All right. That's fab. Thank you very much. After you, sir. Thank you. Brandon can head home. This way. Paediatric A&E bed 27. Bye-bye. May soon be needed by someone else. The Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. Bed 40 is heading back to the day surgery ward. Its patient, 44-year-old Lisa, has just had a new pacemaker battery fitted. Husband Stuart is by her side as she comes round from sedation. Lisa's a um, very brave, lovely woman, lovely mother. Couldn't wish for a better wife or, or mother. Their children are her world. Um, she looks after me and the children more than enough any time to repair. Lisa has a serious heart condition. This is the third heart operation she's had to keep her alive. 
Lisa's friend Kay is back to visit. Oh, a woman after me, oh no. <laughs> you know, don't you? Oh, yeah. All right. It was just the box change, so it was quicker than anticipated, yeah. which was good. Do you notice a big difference once I've changed the box? Not, not yet. I will, I will do. In, in a few days. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Right. Thank you ever so much, Chick. Yeah. Yeah, start. So, if you're feeling up to it after this, we'll go for a little stand and see how you feel. Okay. Lisa's pacemaker is now fully charged her life can begin to return to normal. She'll be released as soon as she can find all her belongings. They made me take my underwear off in the theatre. So, somewhere, I don't know where... Is your undercrackers? A, there'll be some uh, undercrackers. That's obviously on eBay. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Not with the under here. Oh. So, uh, I'll just, I'll just apologise if the cleaners get them. <laughs> Don't, don't worry, I can, I can get, no, I can get home. Anniversary pants, I can, I can get home, Commando, you're OK. <laughs> oh, has she, has she put them there, has she? Bless her, yeah. <laughs> Do you recognise them? <laughs> anyway. Right then. Well, Let's go get you up, OK? <laughs> Problem solved. Lisa is now ready to leave day surgery bed 40. You're very welcome. I can come up on you. You've been a star. You really are. You've worked really hard. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I can't explain it. The feeling, it's sort of like a heaviness that I had before and just felt, you know, um, but I do feel lighter. Um, rest up for a few days. Um, easy exercise to begin with and then gradually build up back to my three times a week. She's in good You've hands. done it before, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, done it so before. He's quite domesticated, so yeah. you'll be OK. Yeah. Well, we'll see if he can look after the uh, house and the girls. Um, obviously, he won't, won't be as good as me, but <laughs> I shall uh, rest up for a couple of weeks and I'm sure he'll do a grand job. Our hospital beds have given us intimate access to the work of the NHS. After a short stint on A&E bed 15, the pain in Lee's chest has gone. Thean had to go back to hospital with tummy pain, but is now OK. And Lisa's heart is beating well. She's back at work and enjoying family life. The beds are now back on their wards, ready and waiting for their next round of patients.